Welcome to a Grace Digital presentation. In this video, we shall be discussing the topic, Mordecai the Silent Hero. Most people that we would consider great are usually those whose acts of service, philanthropy, and exploits can be seen or heard by so many. From time immemorial, those celebrated by society have usually not been those behind the scenes making silent moves, but the people that are visible to many. It is therefore not surprising to see musicians and actors become more famous than producers or directors. However, it is important to study and learn, not just from the heroes of the Bible like David, Samson, and Queen Esther, but also from the unsung heroes. This is because everyone that is part of making exploits happen whether seen or unseen, have stories of resilience, loyalty, and confidence to share if only we care to look beyond the surface. A good example of a silent hero is the man Mordecai, who became Queen Esther's adopted father after the death of her parents. Esther 2, 5 through 7. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, named Mordecai, son of Jer, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those captive was Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. We are quick to celebrate the great woman called Esther for standing up for the Jewish people. Her people, which is awesome, because she took huge risks to bring her people liberty. However, have we paused to think of the fact that there would have been no Esther if there was no Mordecai? He was the one who adopted her as an orphan, took care of her, groomed her, and advised her not to mention her nationality while in the palace. Esther 2, 8 through 18. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa, and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. Immediately, he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Before a young woman's turn came to go in to King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of mirth and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go up there and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihel, to go to the king she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tabath, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any other woman. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. And he proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. Even when Esther became queen and all looked calm on the surface, Mordecai was the one who sent an urgent message to her so that she would be aware of the impending doom being planned against all Jews. Esther 4, 1 through 9. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, 
there was a great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Haddock, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Haddock went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and to explain it to her, and he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Haddock went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. When it was evident that the queen was scared about going to the king so that he could change his decree, Mordecai was the wise one who reminded Esther of her purpose for being queen at such a crucial moment in time. Esther 4, 10 through 17. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman, who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Her faith and confidence to do the unusual and unexpected was boosted because of Mordecai's firm words. Esther 7, 1 through 10. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet, and as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again said, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition, and spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, An adversary and enemy. This vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in rage, left his wine, and went into the palace garden. But Haman realized that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A pole reaching to the height of fifty cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. So the victory of the Jewish people was also due to Mordecai's confidence and passion. Another way that Mordecai proved to be a hero was by helping the king when he discovered a sinister plot to destroy him, without any thought of being rewarded. It wasn't until the king got stirred up by God to reward the man who preserved his life a while back that Mordecai came to the forefront. Esther 6, 1-11 That night the king could not sleep, 
So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on the pole he had set up for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, What should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to the one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor, and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse, and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, This is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. It is interesting to know that right in the middle of Mordecai helping others like the king, queen, and his people, there was a high-ranking official called Haman, who hated him for not just cause. Esther 3, 1 through 6. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha, and Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials of the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day, they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore, he told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. However, Mordecai never became distracted or depressed. Rather, he became more focused on doing only what was right, and at the end of the day, his enemy fell into the very pit that he earlier dug for Mordecai. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to look up to different role models and heroes of faith in the Bible. Thank you for teaching me through the life of Mordecai and teaching me that being helpful or positively impactful doesn't have to be done in the eyes of the public. In the name of Jesus, I declare that I shall be focused on doing what is right always, whether in the limelight or behind the scenes. Amen.